So before we get into the dominant American political parties, we're going to start with, again, this, this complex subject of factions. So we're going back to James Madison and Federalist Number 10, where he basically warns America that in a democracy, and we have to remember America is the first democracy since the Greeks and Romans, factions are inevitably going to form. They're going to form. Groups are going to start working together collaboratively to push on the government through what we call pluralism, where many groups are pushing on the government to get what they want. Okay, And the original factions that formed were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, I say they're factions because they weren't parties. They were factions. However, these factions did evolve into parties. The Federalists were, became the Federalist Party, and the Anti-Federalists became the Democratic-Republican Party. Um, so let's look at some of the similarities. Today, we're, we're clearly going to say that the Federalists, they wanted a stronger central government, weaker state governments. That tends to be much more on the Democratic Party side. The Anti-Federalists, later the Democratic Republicans, is what it would evolve in. They wanted power in the states, not the central government. So they liked the Confederacy. They liked the um, they liked the um, centralized power and most of the power to the states was what's called the Confederacy. So that would be more of the Republicans. I think if you met somebody that's Republican today, they would still argue that they tend to be much more on the state side. And also there are people that do believe that certain states in America, such as Texas, should uh, almost be independent of the United States or have super, their power should very supersede uh, the United States government. You know, I'm sure you've heard sayings like, this is how we do things in Texas. Mississippi is another, and Alabama are great examples of states that like to run themselves the way they want to run it, uh, and they don't want a lot of federal government interference. Uh, and so the key leaders that we've talked about, this is Franklin, Hamilton, John Jay, George Washington was a Federalist. Then, you know, really, you got everybody from John Hancock, and then Thomas Jefferson is going to really push with the Anti-Federalists later on. Uh, and some big ideas we're going to look at again is they favored a constitution was the Federalists. And the Anti-Federalists, they wanted to stay with the Articles of Confederation. And the Bill of Rights, which is very much a debate between the now dominant parties, Republicans and Democrats, on what it means and, and to what, what rights are inalienable. Or they just cannot be touched. And then... Back then, even, they were, demographically, they are different. People lived in urban areas tended to be much more Federalist-friendly, and people that lived in rural country areas tend to be much more anti-Federalist or Democrat-Republican-friendly. And we're going to see that today, as the Republicans tend to do very well in rural areas, and the Democrats tend to do much better in urban areas. Suburbs get more cut up, but we'll see how they tend to lean, too. So let's start with the first party that's still here. The dominant party that's still a big part of America today. It's actually a Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party evolves out of the Democratic Republicans, as I mentioned. They actually would have been the Republicans by our standards today, which is interesting. They're the oldest of the parties. It started in 1824. Uh, Andrew Jackson is really considered the leader, of the, uh, the beginning of the Democratic Party, as, as they knew it then. Uh, definitely not the case now. They, Andrew Jackson was much more rural much more of a kind of like he had some character almost like a trump like very sharp talker people liked him he got a, he got along well with men and like he really liked uh that atmosphere of, of, of guns and hunting and things like that he originally called the the democratic republic government they um uh, republicans and the government must regulate business for citizen safety so really they want to limit the amount of power the government has it's really just to regulate uh certain things um cert certain things that they they really want to focus in on is to protect the citizens themselves so in this case they really want to regulate businesses um they want to make sure they put the citizen first and not necessarily the business or the person that owns the business democrats tend to believe in what's called a progressive tax that's that more money you make, the more taxes you pay percentage-wise. It's not just money. It's percentage-wise. And this is called progressive taxing. So if you make no money in America, like are you make very little income, you could actually not pay taxes or even get some taxes back, uh, some supplemented money. So if you're making like $7.20 an hour, $7.25 an hour minimum wage, 
And at the end of the year, you could actually get your tax more taxes back than you would pay. They take it out initially, but you could get more back. But that's a progressive tax. Where if somebody makes $100,000, they might have to pay 35% taxes. Because the, the argument is that if you took 5% of the taxes out of somebody that makes $20,000 a year, that's really going to hurt them. That's that's $2,000 or uh, $1,000 or 5% is is devastating when you have no money to start with. Where somebody makes $100,000 and they pay 30% taxes, well, they're going to be okay. They can live on $70,000. And the more money you make, the, the more the tax progresses. And this is actually how taxes are paid in America currently. And it gets much more complicated than that. There are a lot of loopholes in tax payments. So people have a lot of money. They tend to uh, be able to manage this in a way that they could pay less taxes than they they probably would outright. Uh, and that, that's aggravated and caused a lot of conflict. Also, with the new Trump tax that pay, passed the last several years, there's a lot of tax cuts for very wealthy people. And we're going to find that that's very consistent with what the Republican Party believes in. That's not an issue if you're a Republican. Um, taxes are for public education, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and possibly universal health care. So uh, probably the majority of Democrats, especially socialists, uh, Democratic socialists are more liberal Democrats, and not necessarily Democratic socialists, believe in universal health care, that we need to move to that way. Um, however, there's a lot of much more um, moderate Democrats that want to still stay uh, as Bill, or I'm sorry, as um, Joe Biden and Barack Obama have kind of set these systems of where the government subsidizes the insurance for the U.S. government. They don't want to go all the way to a free health care system, but like a very low cost subsidized, meaning if you make less money, you don't pay much for health care. And it works the reverse of a progress tax, like you don't pay as much for health care. And if you make a lot of money, then you wouldn't qualify, you have to pay for your your health care um, and it makes it more affordable and accessible that we can get everybody in America hopefully insured would be the idea um, and we're going to really break down these programs obviously public education social security medicare medicaid possibly universal health care we'll talk about those much more all right so democratic party 1824 we're going to get a little bit more into the history of it is going to realign and that's the realignment that you guys know under the party realignment, the Democrat realigned under Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1932. So whenever we talk about this, like in history books or our tests, you're probably going to, they're going to say, when did the Democratic Party realign? And the Democrat Republicans split, got rid of the Republican side, and it became the, um, they became the Repu the Democrats party. And, and then the Republicans came back and that we'll find out was the party of Lincoln. So they were totally flipped. So now, the Democrats today are probably nothing like the Repub the Democrats of then. Actually, the Republicans uh, under Abraham Lincoln are much more like the Democrats today. And I know that's confusing. And Roosevelt is really giving credit credit with, with flipping the, the parties completely. He's this wealthy, very progressive Democrat in New York. And the Democrats at the time were still mostly a Southern conservative, states' rights, more anti-federalist-oriented, and Roosevelt start pushing the party the other way. I would argue, historically, that you could have a good argument that the 1920s is really when the Democrats start becoming much more progressive, and they really, it had a lot to do with immigration, too. Um, the 1920s, they really started attracting immigrants, and prohibition was a big issue for the Republicans with and the Republicans became much more conservative and prohibition. They're against drinking alcohol. And um, that started the big division where the parties started divide in my mind. But when you ask, uh, you ask somebody on the test, they're probably almost always going to point to 1932 when FDR is considered the father of the modern day Democratic Party. Party realignment is when the balance of power between a country's political parties changes greatly. Uh, it changed immensely greatly. In, in the line in 1932, but it wouldn't be completed until arguably in the 1960s. The Democrats really became very much the Republicans of Lincoln, and then the Republicans really pushed the other way. They had kind of had been attracted to a state with segregation, much more anti immigration uh, than the Democrats, and they start moving towards the Democrats before Roosevelt, if that makes sense. 
FDR is considered the father of the modern-day Democratic Party. And we and I think I've said this, that uh, Barack Obama, usually when they ask presidents when they first started, I remember reading an interview where they asked Barack Obama, like, who, what president do you look for uh, guidance and insight? Because he inherited the Great Recession in 2008. A lot of people forget that. And he said, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had inherited the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, and he's kind of seen as, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, Roosevelt is considered one of the greatest American presidents. Um, but if you're a Republican, you're going to say this is the beginning of an end of America. Roosevelt did, he started bringing centralized government and programs, and there's no, and it's, and we've been trying to take, take that out ever since. They've been trying to get rid of these programs. So let's look at what the programs are and where it went. So and you can even see this message of Barack Obama. It's more of hope and what the government can do and make people's lives. So some big ideas behind the, Demo behind the Democratic Party is the environment is more important to business and limits pollution production. You have the very progressive Democrats uh, like Bernie Sanders, Alexander Cortez, uh, Asciato Cortez, who has also proposed like a Green New Deal where if we really invest money and time into the environment, we could all benefit from this, and it could create jobs and infrastructure. That's a very democratic idea. The Republicans don't want government getting involved in that at all. Uh, if anything, they like the subsidies we provide for gas and oil companies. Workers are entitled to livable wages and benefits. You can see the debates on minimum wage. Democrats, especially very progressive Democrats, they say, look, minimum wage should be at least $15 right now. More moderate Democrats are not necessarily going to argue with that, but they might say something like, yes, but maybe more logically, you have to progressively integrate that. You can't just make $15 the standard tomorrow. That could have serious uh, business consequences and economic consequences. Uh, so I know Joe Biden is more for like a progressive increase. So like this year, maybe it goes up to $10 Um minimum wage and then next year it goes up to eleven dollars so that gives the business a chance to kind of to get ready for this and there's obviously major points on both sides they all argue that if you if you gave fifteen fifteen dollars an hour is the minimum wage then that would lift nine hundred thousand people it's a million people out of poverty um and many other people at uh 40 percent of americans that live on minimum wage are in fact the the main money maker of the household which is just hard to believe that almost one out of two people that make minimum wage are in charge of, of taking care of their families. I think a lot of times people think of minimum wage, uh, especially Republicans would say, oh, no, minimum wage is usually teenagers. Or, like, you live with your mom, and you guys, you don't necessarily need to make 15 bucks an hour to work at McDonald's or something. But is that devaluing that service? I don't know. Now, this is a very important concept in economics, and this is a huge battle. And I would say that this is one of the, if not the most centralized battles today. Um, and some of it's tapered off, especially on the Republican side. But the Democrats are almost always hitting this idea of Keynesian economics, Manor Keynes. So we've read about Manor Keynes and how he met Roosevelt. And actually, Roosevelt at first kind of thought the guy was a little strange, and that the economist, he's a British economist, Basically, he didn't explain anything in a way he could understand it. It just went over his head. But then, in the end, he actually clinged on to Keynesian economics. And that has been used by Barack Obama in the 2008 um, Great Recession. No questions asked. And it's definitely been used, I would argue, even under President Trump, uh, starting with the uh, recession and the pandemic. And, again, Joe Biden is constantly proposing Keynesian economics. So what is Keynesian economics? Well, it's the government gives money back to the lower class and they spend it to stimulate the economy. It's also you need to raise government spending, especially in times of crisis or the economy is unstable. So what happens when the economy gets bad under Keynesian economics, like the Great Depression, the government starts hiring people uh, or creating jobs. The government starts spending money where the, the private sector and private companies and people don't have money anymore, it's the government's job to kind of come in and, boom, intervene in the economy and prop it back up before it turns into a great depression. So we could deal with the recession, but if we make the wrong choices, Keynes is going to argue it could turn into a depression. Okay, So a recession is where the economy recedes. So in 2020, the, the economy shrunk 
2%. 2%. So there's 2% less money, 2% less wealth in America uh, in 2001. And there's more people. There's more people with less money. So that means people lost money or money went to certain people and other people didn't get it. So that's a recession, receding. Think of like your, when your waistline recedes because, you know, you lost some weight or you stopped eating, all, you know, sugar all week. That's a recession. But a depression is when you just tank out. And if it starts spiraling out of control, everybody can be affected. It could just take everyone out, as the Great Depression did. And then you're talking about 25%. They had almost 25% of people didn't have jobs during the Great Depression. As opposed to we got, you know, in the 12 percent or maybe even close to like a 15 which is insane at the beginning of the pandemic but a lot of stuff's been balanced we're still under 10 percent unemployment which is it's not great but it's not anything like we're seeing in a recession or depression and a lot of it has to do with government intervention so governments spend money they hire people they build bridges like a Keynes economist would say this is the perfect time to build infrastructure just like the green new deal which is very keynesian why not spend lots of money now, the government, to build and subsidize solar energy, which is good for the environment and will create lots and lots of jobs for the future? And we're going to find out that this is considered, uh, you know, almost a sin to talk about in the more conservative Republican uh, camps. So here's some of the general ideas that they've created and supported. Actually, they've created all these ideas, the Democrats uh, that we know of today. Really started with Social Security under Roosevelt, which is this idea that if you make if you're a certain age and now it's 65, you get full, you're not, it's not enough money that you have a good life or you're taking care of the rest of your life, but it's enough money that you don't starve and you have a place to stay and maybe some clothes on your back in the winter kind of thing. And when, what happens is everybody pays into social security except for very small groups, which I don't want to get into it, which is like specifically like even public school teachers sometimes don't pay social security, but almost everybody pays into the system and then we all get money when it comes out. And originally under Roosevelt, it was 10 people paying into to support one person, okay? Now, it's something like five or four people paying in to support one person. So less and less money is coming in to support those people. People are living much longer. I mean, Social Security was you got in like your 50s, and people didn't live that long back then. You just think about the health choices they made. They would smoke, uh, drink probably heavier than we do. Um, and also the medicine just was nowhere near as good. Like people would die from polio or get sick from uh, smallpox uh, and other issues and had a lot of health problems. They just weren't as clean. So that program has to keep evolving or spend more money into it, or you're going to have to cut the program. And that's a big debate you're going to have to deal with as uh, adults. Now, Medicare takes care of the elderly. So under Medicare, when you turn 65, you have health care. The US, It's basically the government's health insurance. So they pay money and they'll pay most, not all, they'll pay most of your costs to help take care of you when you're 65. This was not started under Roosevelt. This was actually started under Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ Johnson, uh, who's the president after Kennedy was assassinated and during Vietnam. And the argument under this is that, look, people that are 65 or they're older, nobody wants to insure them. Like companies aren't going to give somebody insurance that's older. And if they do, it's super duper expensive. So grandma or grandpa cannot afford $3,000 a month for health care because we're all getting older and we're all getting sicker and we're all going to die. So that's not profitable for an insurance company. We'll step in when you turn a certain age. We're going to take some money out now to help pay for this. And we'll step in and you're entitled to this. So these are entitlement programs. So Medicare is an entitlement. You're born with, you're going to get this. You're going to get this. Medicaid is also an entitlement. Social Security is definitely an entitlement. You, if you make it to 65 right now, you're going to get Social Security. And you could you can get it earlier. It's complicated. You, you get smaller amounts of money. Then you have Medicaid, which is aid for children and parents in need. Okay, So people that are super uh, low or poor or, or very low, have a lot of poverty. Um, the argument the Democrats would make is, look, if somebody's old enough and they can't get health care anymore, that's the government's responsibility to step in and support and help people that are older. And also, it's the government's responsibility to step in and help children that their parents can't afford health care for them. And to provide health care for some people that can't afford health care, uh, just can't qualify, or cannot afford it. Um, 
and it's it's much more harder to qualify for an adult but children can qualify for medicaid we're going to aid those in needs care is taking care of the elderly medicaid is aiding those in need and high need okay then there's other programs like public assistance welfare programs we think of welfare you think welfare just means government assistance is really for the betterment of the welfare of the people uh, and the biggest recipients of welfare, I think a lot of people have these these images in their head on who gets welfare. And believe it or not, the biggest recipients of welfare are really corporations in America. Companies and corporations get much, much, much more money than any individuals combined ever could dream of. Uh, I think the last stimulus, there was something like $500 billion that just nobody knows where it went. Well, if it wasn't paid out back to people in checks or wasn't spent on infrastructure or paid on us, where did this money go? Well, probably a lot of it went to uh, giving money to companies and corporations and subsidizing them. The government is using tax money to take care of these companies. You could see that this has been a big conflict in St. Louis, Missouri. We've had huge issues where we got huge companies like Anheuser-Busch, uh, Centi, Cortex in St. Louis City, and they basically will, will build brand new buildings or they'll get infrastructure even the cardinals and they pay basically no taxes because they get tax welfare or abatements tax abatements and then we can't figure out why we can't afford schools or we don't have enough police officers well if these companies don't pay any taxes and there's not enough revenue how do you pay for things like uh, you know a well-trained well-paid uh, police force or a good education system so you can see the differences just when you go down to the county or different parts of st louis where the tax revenue is, uh, and who's got more taxes collected from companies. Like, you know, I live in Brentwood, and they we have a lot of tax revenue from Target and Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and Micro Center and Best Buy, all these big companies, and we don't have that many kids in our school district, only about 800 kids. So we got all these taxes that help pay for our education system. Now, Affordable Health Care Act, that's, uh, people call it Obamacare. It's actually not the correct name. It's just called the Affordable Health Care Act. And that was one of the pride and uh, pride and joys of the Democrats. They pushed that in 2008, finally got done. 2010, it was officially integrated. Now, people that uh, most people that can't afford health care qualify for Obamacare. And that happens every year. Right now, they're doing uh, sign-ups. So they're going to open the, Joe Biden opened the window for three months for people to sign up and get that subsidized health care. And then finally, a lot of... Um, a lot of Democrats are pushing for universal health care or single-payer health care, meaning everybody just has health care. We pay for it in our taxes, and we just have health care. So if somebody's sick, you just go to the hospital. And if you want, they're not saying you get rid of private health care. I had a really good talk with a man from uh, England once. They still have private health care, but I said, well, how is the British health care? He's like, it's fantastic. If you if you have an emergency or anything's wrong with you, always go to the emergency room. Use the public health care. He says people like the private health care because they do have like nicer rooms or they get flat screen televisions, you know, with Netflix and stuff like that. But you're not really it's it's not that you're getting better or worse doctors necessarily or nurses. It's more of like you have a nicer room and better technology and you feel like you're treated better. But you could still have private health care and uh, public or universal health care. All right. Here's a question for you. The government often finds it difficult to make substantive changes to entitlement programs or which are the following reasons. So think of the things I just named as entitlement. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. People want that. Like, that stuff is enti they're entitled to. Why is it so hard to cut back or get rid of it? Most such programs were established by constitutional amendments. These programs are extremely popular among their numeral be beneficiaries. Such programs are vital to the national defense. Most such programs primarily benefit the wealthy, a powerful political bloc, or E, the program's uh, budgets are determined by non-elected bureaucrats and not by Congress. Okay, and that was B. The programs are extremely popular among numerous beneficiaries. The problem with entitlement programs and government subsidies and help is once you get it, nobody wants to get rid of it. So once I get it, I would like to keep it. So I don't really want to get rid of my Social Security. I'm going to be pretty upset if I've worked and put money into Social Security and then the government has to take it away. Or they're going to change the age to like 90, so I don't even live to get it. So people like entitlements, even people that tend to vote Republican a lot of times. Now, they tend to be supported by the socially liberal. Democrats tend to be socially liberal. Not all, 
There are socially conservative Democrats called Blue Dog. Uh, you've got Blue Dog Democrats, which are, um, they tend to be um, more conservative. So personal privacy and protection of minority rights is very important to Democrats. Okay. So we talk about minority rights. So if it's, we have to protect minority groups, like people that aren't religious against the majority, which are people that are Christian or in religious. So you got to protect their rights. So something like prayer in schools could, you can't have atheist or deist students or Muslim or other students that don't aren't Christian, Jewish, and then they would feel very uncomfortable in a public school, a government paid school, being forced to pray a Christian prayer. That might be against their beliefs. That's a minority. African Americans should be treated equally. Like Black Lives Matter tends to be much pushed much more through the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Because minority rights are really important. Other minority Latinx, LGBTQ tend to be much more Democrat. Because they will they try to take their, their views into account. You can see even the cabinet of Joe Biden is diverse. He values diversity in the cabinet. He has an openly gay uh, uh, trans, uh, transportation secretary. Uh, he has, um, we even have high up uh, um, transgender people in, in the government in this administration. We have a lot of diversity, a lot of African Americans, Latinx. Uh, even the, the, the head of the secretary of education is Latinx and you have a lot of people of different classes and he himself was, you know, uh, working class Irish American. So they, they really pride themselves on protecting minorities, even though the majority of people are white in America and the majority of people are Christian. They believe abortion should be legal. And just to be clear, socially liberal people can be Republicans. You can be a socially liberal Republican, like, uh, Probably the biggest example is a lot of uh, a lot of socially liberal Republicans are like California. You have to be pretty socially liberal to get elected in California, but they they like the conservative economics. So, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is definitely socially liberal, but he was the governor of California, and he is a Republican. He's still a Republican. So abortion should be, he believed abortion should be legal. They say it's they're pro-choice. The majority of Americans are pro-choice. Um, they should they they're very much about protecting the woman's body and they don't think the government has any rights to entitlements to a woman's body so that's a sacred or safe area and that by making it illegal the argument would be that women have no control over their body and the government is involved in their body forcing prayer in schools is unconstitutional so uh you can see this that this is a debate but i'm sure in many parts of the united states especially in the south you could probably go to public schools and there's there's morning prayers and people pray led by administration. I'm not saying prayer as in students are praying. That's 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 First Amendment protected. Like a student can go pray. Um, I actually had many years ago a story. Uh, I had a student that was Muslim and they went to go pray. And I was walking up the hallway and I saw the custodian just like yelling at this kid. And I'm like, what is going on? And the kid was a Muslim. He said that, you know, the science teacher had sent him into that room so he could pray. And it scared the custodian because the guy was on the floor because he was trying to to, to pray towards uh, Mecca. And, and, you know, follow his, the uh, traditions and the way you pray. And it was just, I tried to calm down the um, custodian and it, it wasn't a big deal in the end. But it just scared him that this, this kid was in there. He didn't know that the science teacher had told him that he could go in there for privacy. Okay. They believe they're against capital punishment should be illegal. They're against the death penalty. The death penalty, is they would say, is against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are the only country uh, in the Western world that has a death penalty. Um, I believe, other than Japan, I think Japan does actually have the death penalty under extreme circumstances. So the fact that you said that people, the, the federal government and federal law, you can receive the death penalty in America. Many states do not have the death penalty, like Wisconsin, um, Nebraska just got rid of the death penalty. Illinois has got a moratorium. They've put a hold on it. But I remember that like Jeffrey Dahmer, when I was in high school, who had eaten, literally eaten these uh, young teenage males mostly, he was sentenced to life in prison. He couldn't get the death penalty because in Wisconsin, there is no death penalty. Uh, and, and, and 
you know, horrifically in the end, he was actually murdered in prison. But the point is that they think it's a human right and it's sacred. It's not for government or politicians or judges or juries to determine who receives death. And actually that people should be treated with some dignity in prison. They could be innocent or we don't understand all the circumstances of why somebody got in prison. It's the government's responsibility to fight a war on poverty. I know it's cutting it off. It says poverty and to help those in need. Very important to the Democrats to fight for, against poverty. Um, and that goes back to Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He said, we're going to have a war on butter, guns and butter. Guns we can fight in Vietnam and defend democracy in America, I would say. And then butter is you could have Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security. We're going to have these programs to help people in need. We could have it all. Uh, was one of his arguments during World, the Vietnam War. And you could see some of the programs like Section 8, housing, you've got EBT, which are programs where people are given money to buy food on like a, it's like a debit card system essentially, and they're given money to go get food and take care of themselves and their families, make sure nobody goes hungry in America. And people will say, well, there's a lot of uh, giving programs that donate a lot of money for charity, and that's true. You know, I'm sure we've all given money to food shelters, but just to give you in a scope of how much help the federal government does, for every $1 we spend in America to help those in need through churches and non-for-profit organizations, the federal government spends $9. In other words, 90% of the people in need are fed by the federal government to the 10% that actually receive money from private charities. So the Democrats might argue, while people have good hearts, they don't have enough money and people are going to have, the government itself is going to have to use the taxpayers' money to help take care of people in the end. Okay, the strongest supporters, and you could look at some of the data here. Uh, they've got, see if you got trends. Males tend to be much more uh, Republican than females, if you notice that. And actually, the lower your education for males, the more likely you are to be Democrat. As you get more educated, you tend to be more um you tend to be more uh, Democrat. I'm sorry. The more educated you get for Democrats, you become much more uh, Democrat. And this is where it gets interesting. For some reason, Republican male, like doctor, men that have master's degrees, not are not master. I'm sorry, doctor degrees tend to be a little bit more Republican. Uh, and that's that's interesting. That's a 56-34. females. Uh, even go down a little bit on the Democrat. They jump around a little too, around doctoral. But still, even with rough numbers like a college degree, females are 52% Democrat. That's But they're more like 70% Democrat when they're well-educated. So they tend to be much more man, or, uh, female, the Democrats. They tend to be much more educated. Um, but not always. Uh, you can see that grade school and lower high school tend to be much more Democrat, too. And so there is some generalizations that people make there. Similarly to the Federalist Party, they believe in stronger central government. And you can see that could be maybe that's something that really attracts uh, females and some other issues we just talked about, like pro-choice. So the strongest supporter is the middle class. They tend to be much middle class tends to be much more Democrat, Republican. Working class or blue collar. Blue collar means like you literally wear a blue sh jean shirt to work. Uh, you know, so like somebody has a blue jean shirt because it's going to get dirty or torn up. So like a carpenter or a union factory worker, glass cutter, stuff like that, pipe fitters. Lower class tend to be much more Democrat. Academia, college professors tend to be much more uh, liberal and Democrat than conservative. There's still conservative universities like Liberty University. That's important for you, maybe for some of you. You might want to know what kind of university. You might want a conservative university. You'd be surprised, though. The University of Chicago is a super conservative econ economics, uh, and it's right in the middle of Chicago. And actually, Barack Obama taught there, even though he's very progressive. It tells you he can kind of get along with anybody. Um, but And then you'll see there's some other universities that are very progressive that tend to be in cities like, you know, like Washington University is kind of a little bit more on the progressive side. Majority female, about 70% of Democrats are female. It's actually, I think, increasing. Unions are very Democrat, like organized labor, teachers unions. Uh, the only union that tends to be a little bit more on the Republican side sometimes is police unions. They tend to be a little bit more Republican. 
African Americans, other minorities, like not uh, immigrants, we've talked about progressives tend to be much more Democrat. Uh, these are all groups, minorities, people of color, LGBTQ tend to be much more Democrat. 